everybody, it's Raina from Blue Cypress Books, and I just want to welcome you all to Book Banter. This evening, I will be talking with Lisa McMahon. Her newest book, The Forgotten Five, Map of Flames, is out now in hardcover and will be out in paperback in November, along with the second book in this series. Um, it is amazing. It's one of the favorite things that I read all summer. And um, I just have to say one of the taglines is X-Men meets Ocean's Eleven. And um, I can't wait to pick that apart. That is such the perfect explanation of this series. So I am going to click this button down here and welcome Lisa onto the screen. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Reina. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm doing so great. i um, having a really good day because I turned in a book today. So today, celebration day. That sounds both exciting and maybe a little bit stressful. Do you just get to take the do you do you take the day and just be like, this is it. This is a win day. Um, it depends on what other stuff I have to do. But today I only had about 10 pages left to edit. And this is um, I was working on book four of this Forgotten Five series. And um, I had about 10 pages left last night and I thought I cannot continue working on this when I've been doing this for, you know, 14 hours straight. I need to really, really make sure I'm nailing these last 10 pages. So I saved them for this morning when I was nice and fresh and uh, got through them. And then I'm like 1030 or so I was finished. And I, I thought, you know, I don't really know what to do when I'm not working on a book. It's always mm -hmm. this really weird thing when I said, you know, you send it off to your editor and you're like, okay, do I just start the next book? <laughs> you know, what do I do now? What do I do with my time? I'm always very used to having several uh, writing things going and having to be worked on. So, so I, right now you're kind of in between. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, sure. Although I already have started the, uh, at least the word document for the manuscript of book five, uh, hoping that there will be one. We don't know yet. Yeah. But. That's, I mean, that's, that's fun. Um, do you do a lot of like world building ahead of time or outlining and such, or do you just like jump right in and start? This is what happened next. I don't really outline. I'm not an outliner at all. I don't enjoy that. I feel like I've already written the book. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband, on the other hand, loves an outline. He's got his first books coming. I think we talked about that when I saw you yeah. at the Institute, but, um, he, uh, he's got a couple of books coming out and he outlines every chapter. And I just, I, I think it's a good thing to show people and to let writers know that it does, you don't have to be a certain kind of way in order to be a good writer. It's just, how do you do it personally? But I, I always know like how the series is going to end. That's my oh. big thing. I always have to know the okay. ending. And then I have like a path to steer toward uh, and that's pretty much all I need. I keep notes on my phone when I'm writing a book thinking, oh, in book five, I need to do this or I need this thing to happen. But that's about it. That's how I handle it. So when you say, you know, the end, do you mean like the end of the whole story, like the whole series or the end of each book? The end of the whole series, I know. And then the by the time I'm starting the beginning of each book, I have a pretty good idea of how the book is going to end as well. Um, but sometimes I get there and I'm like, oh man, I just thought of this other cool thing that's way better, you know? So it just depends. Yeah, you're not locked into anything until it's actually printed, you know? Yes, exactly. Yep. So M Mina has a question. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna read her whole comment. I love all of your books, and I had a question on the Wake series. There was a part where the doctor talks to the main character, and I didn't know what that was about because it didn't go in detail. Hopefully, you can explain what happened to that plot. Do you obviously you know what she's talking about? I oh, don't. Mina, um, <laughs> this is tough because I wrote that those books um, in two thousand six. Ah, where she, the doctor talks to the main character. I don't know. I can't remember what that could be. Um, and if you happen okay. to 
more specifics and you want to like remind me like which book it's in and maybe a sleep study. Oh, that. Okay. Yeah. That, I think that might've been in fade. Um, uh, I don't know exactly. I just I don't remember. Me. Sorry. <laughs> Cause that was like my second book and, and uh, now I've, I'm on book number 29 and you have dumped me. So I'm sorry about that. Well, if you think about it and you come up with anything, we can come back to it later or we can add it to the comments at the end and tag Mina if we have a short answer afterwards. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you for your question, though, Mina, because now we're we're going to think about it. And Lisa's going to have to go back and like revisit her earlier works and be like, what was it? It'll probably happen in like a month from now when I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll be like, oh, that's what it was. <laughs> Thanks for your good attitude there, Mina. I appreciate it. Well, that actually brings something up that I've thought about a lot with people who, like yourself, who have so many, so many books, and you have books for middle grade and books for YA and these different audiences. And so um, what what's something that you find different about writing for YA or middle grade or, or different audiences? And what, what do you like more about it? Because you haven't written YA in a while. Am I correct on that? So, correct. yeah. Uh, was that a conscious switch or would you go back or what? I've thought about going back to YA. Um, I would love to write another kind of a love story. Um, but I feel like wh where I was in my life at the time when I, I have eight young adult books and then like 20 middle grade books. And I sort of started transitioning as the um, Visions series was out. Um, and it was because my kids were about the age, the middle grade age, they were 12 and nine. And uh, I, they helped me come up with the idea for my first middle grade book, which was The Unwanted. And that's probably my most well-known book. Um, and do you want to hear the story of how? Yeah, please. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so uh, they were 12 and nine and they came home from school one day and they had a letter in their backpacks that said, dear parents, we're so sorry to tell you that we have to eliminate the arts classes at school and uh, because of budget cuts. And so we won't be having art or music or theater anymore. And I remember feeling terrible about this because my kids really love those classes. My son is an artist. My daughter's an actor and a singer. And um, I remember looking at them and saying, wow, kids, you know, I am so sorry. It kind of feels like you're being punished for being creative. And then, as it happens with writers, we say, what if a lot? Like, what if? And I remember thinking, what if there really was a world where children were punished for being creative? And I said it out loud and my 12 year old son said, not just punished, sent to their deaths. And I was of like, course. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the Unwanted series and that ended up being 14 books. And so, you know, I began writing the Unwanted with, um, and write exactly in the commons of Quill when all of the 13 year olds were being put into categories. And we find out that our main characters who are identical twins, uh, one of them is considered wanted and the other is unwanted. And we follow both stories um, throughout all 14 books. So. so I put a link to all of Lisa's books in the comments. Uh, you can click on that and you can find all the books we're talking about this evening. Um, so Mina has another question. What would you give a starring writer with advice, good or bad? It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you're just beginning to write, um, writing is a lot like being an athlete or a musician. You really have to practice. And so if you can set an, you know, make sure you're setting enough time to do some writing, like if, whether it's every day, I don't think people say you have to write every day. I don't write every day. That would be a lot. <laughs> oh, I'd have 60 books by now if I wrote every day, but, uh, but 
definitely write regularly. And sometimes it doesn't feel good to write. Like you're like, I don't know what to write about. I can't think of anything. Sometimes you just have to sit your butt in the chair and go do it and just give yourself, you know, one paragraph. I'm just going to write one paragraph today. And sometimes that's enough to jog something exciting and good and really get you going. Um, other things, other advice I'd like to, to offer is, um, Think about your favorite book, the book that you love more than any other book, the one you've read like five times or 10 times or a hundred times. And, you know, I want you to read it again as if you're a writer and think about what parts of this book am I looking forward to, even though I know exactly what's going to happen because I've read it so many times. You know, what is it about this book that I identify with or that I love? Is it a romance? Is it uh, action? Is it, you know, a scene between friends? What are those pieces that you love? And then I want you to try and use your own characters and mimic the things that you loved in that scene in your own writing. And I think that's a really good exercise to just learn how to be a better writer. Yeah, I kind of love that. And I know that, um, early when I was in school, uh, I would think, oh, I'm, I'm cheating. Like I'm stealing someone's work. Like that's because I could never use this for anything because I'm ripping off somebody else's scene. Right. Mm -hmm. But if it's a writing exercise, like maybe, but just like what you're talking about, you could practice like a musician practices scales. They're not going to that's not a song that they're going to use later necessarily. It's not going on the album, but day after day you practice these scales or you practice someone else's song so that you can eventually write your own. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, thinking of it, musician, my family uh, are musicians. So I often think about it that way as well. Uh, you're not, it's okay that you don't use it later. You're just having a, having a good time and practicing. Exactly. And nothing you write, if you're writing something and you're like, I just don't want to finish this, or this is not my best work. I want to start something different. I, I think that's fine. That's okay to do. And you didn't waste any time. Every word that you wrote was practice and everything you wrote, you learned things about yourself and about your writing style that you wouldn't have learned if you hadn't done it. So nothing's wasted. Absolutely. So with the Forgotten Five, and I said this in the introduction, they describe it as uh, X-Men meets Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. I got two things to say about that. First of all, I love the Ocean's Eleven reference because middle grade kids may have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then I have to, like their parents do, and their parents are like, ooh, that sounds very interesting. And I've, I have not had, no one has asked me yet, but I'm waiting for someone to go Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, here's a whole other thing that I've, you know, I can expose you to. And that's great. But I love how that, that line appeals to both the kids and their parents all with one line. Um, and so then my further my kind of question about that is we always ask authors if they had any input in the cover. They never ask if you've had any input in the, the flap. Like this is the description of the book. So in a hard cover, you get usually the description on the inside flap. Did you write that? The copyrights that who writes that? And like, do you get to even if it's not you, do you get to read it and like it? Dislike thumbs up, thumbs down. What, how does that work? <laughs> it depends on your editor. Honestly, and I didn't really know this until I'd had several editors that everyone does it differently. Uh, for the Unwanted series, uh, my awesome editor, Lisa Abrams, uh, would always ask me to write the flap. She's like, you're really good at it, and I really want you to do that. And I would always go, oh, this is hard. It's really hard to write the flap copy. Um, but I would pound it out, and my husband would chime in, and he was he's really good at, at writing that kind of thing. Um, so he would always help me. But when I started the Forgotten Five, um, I, I didn't really have anything to do with it at all. And when they send me a proof of the flat of the entire cover, uh, that's the often the first time I read it. 
um, even though it's not on the cover yet, I can always make changes or ask for changes. But um, yeah, so I actually prefer not writing the, the copy. I always find it so interesting what someone else thinks the book is about. And yeah. because it's always, you know, I'm so in it, you know, my head's in this book and I feel like I can't really see it for what it is to the, you know, the readers. So I love that I don't have to do that uh, at, with these particular books, but it's always fun to see, um, you know, what what they write. And I've also used a couple different comparisons. I love the Ocean's Eleven as well and the X-Men, but I do sometimes speak to like third graders and stuff, fourth graders, right. and they might not know. So I also use the comparison of uh, The Incredibles meets Spy Kids. And I think that gives a similar like understanding with a little bit of a younger audience. Yeah, I, de I can definitely see that. And um, my son, my son is 15 now. So he's kind of oh. in that, we, right? <laughs> Me too. I do. Back when we had lunch <laughs> together after doing some school visits a number of years ago. And mm -hmm. that was longer ago than I thought. <laughs> right? It's children are great for that. There's like, wait, he was only here and now he's here. That's a long, lot longer than I thought. Yeah. For sure. But he was kind of in this in this in between. We did the Incredibles. But he wasn't super into spy kids. So it's funny like thinking about what how that works in my head as opposed to how it would work if you were talking to like an eight year old or a ten year old today. They know exactly what you're talking about. Um well, Mina's asking, she, so, okay, we're going to go back to her, her comment for that. Mina has a book. Congratulations, Mina. Good job. If it's, it, it, yeah, if you, you got it in like written enough that you know what the, what the book is like, I, that impresses me so oh, much. We met, it looks like at NTTBF. That's wonderful. That's so cool. Um, I'll actually be back in Texas for um, my upcoming tour but i'll be in houston i'll be in dallas too so yeah if you want to come to dallas uh, that would be fun um but i see your your question there about your book and if i would be able to read it and actually i can't um partly because i'm always writing two books a year and i just don't have time and i always have like the books that are being about to be published in the world people are asking me to, to read them and write blurbs for them. So I already have a stack that's about higher than my head of stuff to read. But um, here's what I did. I didn't have authors to read my books either, but um, I found a group of people who also like to write stories. Uh, back when I was a kid, I found them in school. Um, when I became an adult, I started to find them online. And uh, that's what I would recommend doing. Uh, find your group of people. Find people who write stuff similar to you. You can go to Wattpad, I think. Um, I haven't done this in a while, so I'm not sure what the, the different websites are. But I would recommend doing some searching there and finding some other peers to uh, read your stuff. But congratulations. That's so exciting. Yes. And I, I'm going to definitely second that to like online there are groups and um, don't be afraid to get in there like a, or even in person. If you hear about somebody that meets at some coffee shop, you know, a little group, don't be afraid to go and and shake their heads and say hi, because nine times out of ten, they I mean, they they were just like you. They had a first thing that they had written and didn't know how to get feedback on it. And so as soon as you show up, anytime I've ever encountered a group like that, everyone is incredibly welcoming. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, they're just like, yes, grab a coffee, come sit down. What do you write? Like it, yeah. you, you make some friends pretty easily in my experience and from what I've heard, you know, from other people too. Um, so NTTBF is the, I just looked it up, North Texas Teen yeah. Book Festival. You looked oh, at while you were talking at the same time, like I, you, you met. You were talking. Oh, I was, I was typing. <laughs> North um, Book Festival is one of the best festivals I've ever been to. I absolutely adore it, and uh, so I'm so glad that that you were there, Mina. What town is it in? It's because it just says North Texas, and I, I don't in fact have the time to read through the entire website. So, 
Irving, Irving which is n north of Dallas, mm -hmm. maybe. Yep. Uh, it's in the Dallas area and like maybe between Dallas and Frisco. I could, I might not have that exactly right, but. <laughs> I, ha I have been to Irving. Oh, okay. um, my husband travels for work and he has for like 17 years. And um, when our son was younger and he wasn't in school yet, we would sometimes we'd go with him. So I've spent like a week in Irving Neat. for no reason other than just being at the holiday or the Hampton Inn and trying to find things to do while he actually went to work. <laughs> yeah, it's held at the Irving Convention Center. Yeah. And there's a couple of hotels right across the street and some great places to eat around there, too. Texas is a great place for those hidden places to eat. Like you, you think, oh, there's nothing here but like Applebee's and I, you know, you know what that is. And then you ask somebody and they're like, no, 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 go past the Applebee's like down here and then make a right. And yeah, it's in a strip mall, but it's the best, whatever, fill in blank food you've ever eaten. And they're exactly. right. And you know who knows where the best spots are? Booksellers. Bookstores are great for asking. I always, I mean, people come in here and ask us all the time and about whatever. They're like, this is a strange question, but, and I'm like, it's not as weird as you think. The best, ta <laughs> the best tacos, if you go one block down this way and make a right, tacos. <laughs> like, it's amazing. <laughs> like, it's not as strange as you think. Um, and yeah, I would do that all the time. Anytime I'm in a little town and I'm going to be there for a while, if there's a bookstore, I always go in and say hi because I'm a bookseller, but then also I have a three-year-old that I need to park. Where, like, where do we, is the best coffee? You know, all of these things that they know, they know the answers. Wow. Yeah, they for sure do. <laughs> Love them. You, you know what, Mina, you should write a brief summary of your story so that it's easy to um, let people know what your book is about. Yeah, that's something you do as, for you. as a writer whenever you're wanting to get published is you need to be able to pitch your story. And what I mean by that is um, just be able to say something that lasts 20 or 30 seconds that describes the book. Like I might say about the Forgotten Five. Uh, Map of Flames is about five supernatural kids raised on a deserted hideout who enter civilization for the first time ever to search for their missing criminal parents and the stash they left behind. And that's a great like summary to get people hooked and get them excited about it. So I would totally recommend uh, writing a summary of your story. And if you wanted to do that now in the comments, um, I'd be happy to look at that for sure. <laughs> That'll be fun actually. I would love to read that as well. Um, so you told us the inspiration for Unwanted, like how that spark started. What was the spark for Forgotten Five? Great question. <laughs> so I was finishing up the Unwanted, a 14 book series, and I hadn't had to really kind of come up with a, a new idea in a while. I I knew I had to come up with new things for every book, but um, I was thinking about like, what was I missing in children's literature? And um, in media in general. And I always thought there aren't enough kids superheroes. There's all these superheroes and they're all adults and stuff, but what about when they're younger? What about, you know, why can't we have a lot of stories about, you know, supernatural kids as they're learning how things work? So, um, uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of what started it. And I got to thinking about how to not just have these supernatural kids, but where's the conflict there? And I thought, well, what about, you know, when I, I love the Incredibles, when I watch the Incredibles, I think about the villains and I'm like, what about their kids? Like, are they villains too? Or do they want to fight against their own parents' beliefs at times? And how would that go? And what would that, what would happen to those families? And, you know, I'll, there's just a lot of um, interesting dynamics to a story where you've got a lot of conflict like that, where you've got these criminal parents who are supernatural, who've done some bad things, and you've got their children now who are growing up in isolation and they're, about to enter society, a society where they know they will be in big trouble because it's a society that's against supernatural people 
mostly because of what their parents did, <laughs> back, you know, years ago. Um, so, you know, it was just so, so complicated, but so not complicated at the same time. And it just really, uh, this whole story came about pretty quickly um, and how to like make it play out. And I've just had the best time writing. I'm like I said, I, I turned in book four and the family issues and dynamics, you know, the, the, the fact that they're fighting and they're supernatural and they've got to, you know, save the world from this terrible president. But, um, you know, it's the family difficulties and how those kids are feeling about their parents because some of them abandoned them. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of, you know, very meaty stuff in this series that I've really enjoyed so much. Well, and you have, you're talking about like the family dynamics, but then you also have this sort of found family dynamics, which, yeah. because they're, they're all like they were criminals the parents were criminals but then they were like banding together for reasons mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you know their kids are friends like you have friends well my parents were friends you know like i have a couple of friends who we're friends mm -hmm. how had you meet well our parents were friends so like mm -hmm. it's just we're just our friends uh, you know and one of them i would say oh is, is close to a sister without being a sister that i have um so that's similar the to this but so you know i i suppose uh, we would say there's found family now yeah but um so you have both of these mm -hmm. and choosing to continue to be friends and get along and work together but they don't they're not blood related a lot of them um and i, I kind of loved that too. yeah right yeah definitely um that was just uh a, so I didn't really intend for it to be as deep as it, it sometimes gets, but I think kids will really relate to it. And, and readers in general will really be able to see these different problems that these kids are having with their parents and go, wow, I had something like that happen in my family too. And, you know, being able to feel like you're not alone yeah. is, is pretty fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they, so one of the things we talked about before we went live and, and I, I definitely want to reiterate is I love the part where they get to discover for the first time for them, a world that's basically like the one we live in. It's very similar to mm -hmm. where we live and these little things that are kind of everyday things that we experience, they're experiencing for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, like, how did you put yourself in that? sort of position to rediscover a, an automatic door for the first time, for example. Yeah, you know, I really had to think that through very carefully. Like what if I'm entering a new society that has technology and I grew up not having technology, but knowing a little bit about it. These kids knew what a cell phone was and they knew what a computer was, but they didn't have them. They didn't have electricity on their uh, in their hideout. So um I had to think about like they knew a teeny bit, but they didn't really understand what they were getting themselves into. Um, and so I thought about, OK, well, money, that's one thing that they would have no idea how to use. And they they've learned about dollar bills and what they do. And but they don't know how to like actually buy something. They've never had to do that before. And they've never really seen strangers before. They only know each other. So going into a world when you're 13 or 11 or 10 uh, and you've never met a stranger before is daunting. You know, you, don't, you have to think about that. And then, you know, I one of my favorite parts came from one of my a different reader, uh, one of the editors who um, when Birdie and Tenor use a toilet for the first time and <laughs> I just had them, you know, figuring it out, but they're like, you could really make a funny scene here with this whole toilet thing and have, if it's like one of those automatic flushing ones and mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it just cracked me up to think about it. Um, but, you know, whenever I would go shopping or whenever I would go out in the world and something technolo technological would happen, like the sliding doors at the grocery store 
you know, I would take a note of that and go, oh, that would be something that they wouldn't be able to figure out. And they'd be like, how does this work? You know, this is magic. So. Oh, okay. So let's, I guess let's read Mina's uh, little outline. My story is about Athena who loses her best friend in a tragic accident and loses herself and had to go through some things to get through this tough time. Mm. Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds really heartfelt to me. It sounds like I'd be, you know, that sounds interesting, like a great story. Um, I think for your uh, description there, you might want to be a little more specific about how she loses herself and one or two things that she might have to go through in order to get through the tough time. So that's how I would tweak your description there a little bit. But no, I think that sounds intriguing. What do you think as a bookseller? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I have a question is, so Athena, we're talking about the goddess. Uh, so is it, I'm assuming, so ba is it sort of based in mythology? Are we using those mythological characters? Or am I reading too much into that? I did not read, read uh, the gods into this, but... Um, I think well, see, I'm not sure. That's this. That's my question. Is this just a, a a person named Athena, or is this Athena a goddess? And that, either way, I'm in. <laughs> but I do think like that tells you these different audiences, right? Because there's a whole whole big audience for, for books that are based on mythology, like mm -hmm. Circe. Okay, it isn't about the goddess. All right. All right. Oh, okay, Thank you for clarifying. Like, because um, Circe and Song of Achilles are big sellers here at Blue Cypress. Like, we have a big market for that. So, my mind immediately goes to, okay. Oh, sure. I can see how that would happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, Scott's got a question here. What do you think of the new wave of book banning in schools? Uh, you know what? I have two kids. I've been a parent for 28 years. And I've always thought it's my job to help my kids pick the things that they should be reading. Um, I've always been very open about that with my kids. Like they can pick a book and I felt like every time they knew if they were ready for the book or not, they would read a few pages and if they, if they weren't ready for it, they would set it down. They didn't want to struggle through a book they weren't feeling comfortable with. So that was always, um, you know, in the back of my mind before I was, or became a writer. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that we as parents, that's our job is to decide what our children read. And it's not my job to decide what someone else's child is uh, ready for and what they're not ready for. So yeah, I, I don't think that this new wave of book banning is a good idea. I feel like a lot of kids who might not be able to see themselves in books very often are going to suffer because they can't, if, you know, books are being taken out of schools and libraries, um, you know, that really takes away from uh, them being able to learn things about themselves and find themselves in books. And that's really tragic to not be able to see yourself in a book. Yeah, and I'd say that I've definitely seen the same thing with my son with kids. Like, th they don't want to do anything they don't want to do. Uh, so it would even be hard for a peer, for example, to pressure them into reading a full book. Like, that would be a, there's a rare child that is going to get through a 250-page book, for example, because their friend is pushing them to do it. They mm -hmm. might buy it. They might get through the first chapter, but they are going to lie about finishing it if they, <laughs> if they don't want to. You know what I mean? They're going to their teacher, to their parent, to their, to their friend, whoever it is that's forcing them to do something they don't want to do. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah. It's really good for parents to talk to their tweens and teens and maybe even read books together. I loved doing that, reading books together with my my 13 and 14 year olds, you know, back when in those days. Um, and it's a great way to be able to talk about some of the things. Maybe I would maybe they would read something that 
about a character doing something that was against the law or, um, you know, something that I wouldn't approve of, but that doesn't mean I don't want my child to know that exists. I would want to say, Hey, in this situation, what should this character have done instead? Like they had a drink at a party. They should have called their parent to pick them up if they were in a situation and that this character didn't do that. But I'd want you to know as my child, you can call me anytime and I will always pick you up. That's what I, I that's what I would do. Oh, absolutely. It, there, it's gateway for a conversation. Um, a, a lot of books and he's kind of reading his own stuff now, but we listen to audiobooks a lot together in the car and I'm not going to lie. There'd been some uncomfortable scenes. I didn't know were coming that all of a sudden I'm sitting next to you and my 12 year old and we just listened to whatever that was. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to hit pause and we're going to have a conversation, you know, but I'm so glad I did because I can't, there's, there's plenty of scenes. I can't think of another segue I would have happened into, you know, Mm -hmm. and books are great for that audio or otherwise. And I will say to everybody out there, uh, forgotten five is a great series to read together because I was thoroughly entertained from beginning to end. And I was just reading it for myself as a bookseller adult like um not you know to sell it but not with a with a middle grader or anything in mind necessarily um and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I know every younger child that has read it and has come back and talked to me has also thoroughly enjoyed it so across the board you could this is when you could definitely read together or read side by side yeah thank you yeah for sure and even like uh, younger, younger kids, but they're, you're still reading bedtime stories. If that's, if any of you are lucky enough to be in that position, uh, yeah, definitely something you could read together for bedtime with an eight-year-old or 10-year-old or something, if they still are letting you do that. <laughs> Absolutely. And I just remember, I have, you know, great memories of when my kids were younger and we would get a brand new book that came yeah, you know, that day and where we picked it up on release day from the bookstore and um, my son would start reading the book. And then after a couple hours, I'd come and sit with him and then I'd start at the beginning and the pages would be sticking up in between and we'd <laughs> sit side by side and, and just devour the new book uh, together that way too, which was really just very special. That's one of my favorite memories. Uh, just, you know, That's fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, we we never did that. It was either together or totally separate. Yeah. And then I would try and start conversations and he'd be like, well, yeah, yeah, mom. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, like you in your example, you know, you know, you can always call me. I know, mom. I know I could call you, you know, <laughs> I was like, all right, well, let me do my mom thing. I do that sometimes now. I'm like, look, I, I'm your mom. So I'm going to need to say these words out loud so that I've said them. You can always call me, you know, if you're at a party, cookie. Like, okay, <laughs> like I've done my mom bit. He's done his kid bit by just listening to me talk <laughs> and we move on. Love it. Like, it's cool. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I, I do. I remember us hanging out when you came and did school visits, which hopefully we could do again, maybe next year. That would be so much fun if you come to town and um, seeing you at Children's Institute and now getting to talk to you. Mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on Book Banter. It's such a cool little thing that you do. And I just think it's it's lovely and wonderful. And thanks to everybody who's been watching and supporting. And oh, if there's anybody who's a Nancy Drew fan who likes Kennedy, my daughter, this is oh. Kennedy's dog. I'm I'm Grammy today. Um, this is Otis. So anyway, um, he just came over right at the end here. So perfect timing. Perfect yeah. timing. All right. All right. Well, thank, you thank you. Thank you all for, for watching. And thanks, Lisa. We'll see everybody.